This week's episode is brought to you by Return Home, my new audio drama side project thing. It's kind of a cross between Gravity Falls and The X-Files, and you know, it's a horror comedy that tells the story of Jonathan Barker, who returns to his hometown to find that things are a little weird. You can find it on iTunes on our returnhomepodcast.com. Hello and welcome to Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show and home of the world's first pair of independently born identical twins. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. And I was about to say, man, am I tired from our trip, but I remember I said that last week about the south of the border thing and we didn't really go on the trip last week. Yeah, we don't really game plan like we should. Well, we're tired from all the animation that we did. With, yeah, um, okay, cool. Yeah, my my arm hurts from animating. That's it. Yeah, 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 that's that's it. That kind of makes sense, maybe. They can't replace us with computers and animation and... No, they cannot. (laughs) We are robots. Let us go to the history segment, From the year 2000. I poked him. He was dead. It's time for Disney History! For the last two episodes, we looked at El Grupo's trip south of the border, and then the making of Saludos Amigos, uh, part of the Good Neighbor program. And after the film came out, Disney still had much more shorts to go in order to fulfill their good neighbor contract with the uh, U.S. government. For example, plans were made to continue the Gaucho series, started by the Goofy film from Saludos Amigos, showcasing stories of other Gauchos. One such film was called The Laughing Gaucho, which featured a boy whose laugh was so shrill it shatters glass. The kicker of the piece was that he decides to go into show business to capitalize on his talent, but he hits puberty, his voice changes, and his laugh loses its effect, thus proving yet again (laughs) that puberty ruins everything. It totally does, guys. I hate to break it to you. Sorry, Leo. Um, (laughs) So another film was... uh, Kaxanga. I'm gonna. That's sure, that's wrong. I'd sure, I think it's Kaxanga. Based on a popular game played with matchboxes done to the rhythm of a song. Now, this one in, uh, revolved around Donald and Jose playing the game in order to win the affection of a female bird named Aurora. And the game was discovered by El Grupo while on their trip, and the entire Disney team fell in love with it and just played it over and over again. Obviously, well before Candy Crush. Oh, uh, yes, I mean, absolutely. Come on. So another version of this short had Donald, Jose, and Goofy all playing the game together. This one had Jose talking to Donald in Portuguese with English subtitles underneath. And when Donald responds, he also has English subtitles. Uh, Of course, Donald being Donald, he comes to blows with his incorrect subtitles. And, And further in the short, due to the rhythmic nature of the song that the game is played to, Donald can't get the beat out of his head and has crazy nightmares about it. Though it was never completed, a lot of animation tests were done for it. Even the idea of Donald's nightmare was repurposed uh, for the short Drip Dippy Donald years later. Speaking of other shorts, there are plenty more that were worked on at this time frame, and they were completed, but were released as short films later on, mostly after the three Caballeros debuted. Uh, and these included Pluto and the Armadillo, which became part of the Pluto and the whatever series, uh, in which Pluto meets some sort of strange animal, and of course, hilarity ensues. Uh, the Pelican and the Snipe was another, as was uh, Contrary Condor and Clown of the Jungle. Now, these films, well, while uh, s- s- pro- byproducts of the Good Neighbor program, only had vague references to South America and thus were never included in any of the package films. However, many of the influences and cultural aspects that the animators learned during their trips wound up vaguely in these shorts. So we also need to talk a bit about the other films that came out of this time period, one of which which was a travelogue documentary of sorts. Using some of the real footage shot while on their trip, uh, along with staged comedy segments, Disney put together the film South of the Border with Disney. 
The film was released almost a year after Saludos Amigos and offered an insider's look at the trip itself. Of course, wanting to make it more entertaining for the viewer, Walt devised a few comedic skits to be peppered throughout the documentary. The film itself was never intended for a theatrical release and was distributed by the CIA, uh, sorry, the CIA to local governments as a sort of propaganda tool to help show how much fun South America could be. Um, but in addition to the live action documentary, Disney also produced a number of indirect propaganda films. So these films, while having a slight Disney touch, were a way to show people in South America a better way of living. The topics ranged from healthcare, agriculture, and educational betterment. The first of these films was The Winged Scourge, which depicted the horrors of malaria and how to prevent them. The film itself is divided into two vastly different parts. The first part uh, vividly shows uh, the devastating effects of the disease with animated diagrams and showed how it was spread by mosquitoes. And the second half, the narrator asked for six or seven volunteers from the audience to help fight the mosquitoes. And the seven dwarfs all volunteer for the duty. So uh, really, it showed, again, the ability Disney had to not only educate, but to entertain at the same time. The next film focused on agriculture and was titled The Grain That Built a Hemisphere. This story centered on the story of corn, and it showed the development of corn in America, its botanical makeup, cultivation techniques, and what some byproducts of corn actually were, like um, corn on the cob, or popcorn, but not candy corn. Boo! Ugh. So this film also included some entertainment in it, though, to try to make it more appealing. And a few more of these films were produced, such as ones about tuberculosis, how to care for your baby, and so on. And they were extremely popular. So while the South American trip of 1941 was highly publicized, smaller groups did make some trips to Mexico in 1942, which helped in the production of their next film. Two and a half years after the release of Saludos Amigos, the South American Group Number no. Two, as they were called, was uh, this group of films was released as the Three Caballeros, and the film premiered in Mexico City on December 21st, 1944, and in the U.S. on February 3rd, 1945. Structurally, it's the same as Saludos Amigos: four short subjects combined into one feature-length film. The big difference, however, is that unlike Saludos Amigos, The Three Caballeros was planned as a feature from the very beginning. The two and a half years between the films allowed the studio to really hone down the structure of the film and create a backbone to transition from one short to the next. This film, of course, included a visit to Mexico. The shorts in The Three Caballeros included The Cold-Blooded Penguin, The Flying Gauchito, Bahia, and La Piñata. Uh, this time, the framing device was that it was Donald's birthday, and he received a box of films as a gift, showing him the wonders of all these different places. The Cold-Blooded Penguin began its life as a generic story, thought up before the original El Grupo trip, about a penguin who hated the cold and wanted to vacate for warmer weather. Sounds like Jeff Heimbach. Basically, yes. Okay. Go on. So uh, the idea was adjusted to feature Pablo, okay, different name, oh. who would move to South American, uh, South American coastal region, as some penguins actually do. And the voiceover narration was done by Sterling Holloway. And for some reason, this short was promoted more than the others, with advertisements for it appearing two years before its eventual release, uh, in some cases. The Flying Gachito uh, features a small boy from uh, Uruguay in the English version, but a boy from Argentina in the Spanish version. Weird. Um, so <laughs> he and his winged donkey, named Burrito, go on some lively mm. adventures. <laughs> um, this short was chosen uh, particularly for its connection to Fantasia. Uh, for whatever reason, Fantasia had a large following in South America, especially the pastoral segment, which featured uh, centaurs and pegasuses. Is that the plural? Pegas Pegasi? Pegas yeah, one of the two. The, I mean, multiple things flying horses, horses. with wings. There we yeah, go. that's better. There you go. <laughs> so, in order to capitalize on the popularity of Fantasia, th they decided this flying donkey film would be included in the Three Caballeros. So, the the first two shorts actually started uh, production in 1941 when El Grupo first returned from South America. They were originally made as individual shorts to be released on their own. Uh, you know, interchangeable with any of the shorts from Saludos Amigos. However, the last two shorts of the film began development, uh, as they did, it, they, it became clear that Saludos Amigos was going to be made into a feature, so extra care was taken to craft them into a coherent story with one flowing into the other. That's why there is a change of sorts in the narrative of the film halfway through. Because the final segment of Saludos Amigos proved popular, they wanted to focus another short on Brazil. 
So, Bahia is the next segment. So, this short also marks the return of Jose Carioca, who became popular in Brazil after the first film. And the sequence involves uh, Jose asking Donald if he had ever been to Bahia, describing it as one of the most beautiful places in the world. And when he reveals he hasn't, Jose invites Donald to join him uh, to go there. The two take a train through a pop-up storybook-like landscape until they arrive at their destination. It's here that the film begins to combine animation and live action together for the first time on screen. Now we use the term, uh, first term, lightly since it had been done before, especially by Disney himself, but never on this scale. So Aurora Miranda entices the boys and a dance fight in, uh, begins over her. And though it looks simple by today's standards, it was a technologically challenging sequence involving rear projections and live action being filmed at the same time. Everything had to be planned down to the exact second, timed exactly, so the live action and the animation could interact, otherwise it would just throw the whole thing off. The sequence also begins a new trend for Donald. Instead of being driven by his temper, he's being driven by his libido. He falls in love with Aurora, I mean, who wouldn't? Mm -hmm. And his feelings of lust only amplify as the film goes on. And thus begins La Piñata, where we are also introduced to the character of Panchito Pastores, a Mexican rooster who shows Jose and Donald the wonders of Mexico. Now Panchito flies the boys on a serape over Mexico, eventually coming to a beach filled with bathing beauties. And, as expected, Donald goes love crazy again, chasing the girls all over the place. Once they have him somewhat under control, they fly back into the sky where Donald falls for a singing Dora Lutz in the sky. And after a kiss, Donald begins to hallucinate a surreal reverie where pretty much a free-for-all happens with Carmen Molina performing a dance. We have no idea what's happening here. I mean, really. <laughs> it just becomes something like Elephants on Parade sequence until Panchito and Jose spice things up for the finale and Donald uh, battles a toy bull filled with all these fireworks to set off the ending. Yeah, so it wasn't always the plan to have a rooster character represent Mexico in the Three Caballeros. The idea came fairly late in the planning process. Uh, early on, the plan was just to have Jose Carioca explain the Mexican customs to Donald. But as late as February 1943, work began on retooling the La Pinata scene to introduce a rooster. And by the middle of that summer, the rooster's character began to take shape, and he was given a name, Panchito. By the end of the summer, they found a voice for the, the, the rambunctious rooster, the popular Mexican stage performer Paco Miller. And he was a great choice. I mean, he could sing, he can uh, perform ventriloquism, and he was beloved by the people of Mexico. And Miller even began doing publicity with Walt and Clarence Nass, the voice of Donald Duck, in Mexico City soon after he was casted. But the studio soon, into, uh, soon ran into an insurmountable problem. Miller's English. He didn't speak a word. They tried writing out the dialogue phonetically, but when he delivered the words, they, they had no feeling. Simple bits of dialogue were taking hours, so the studio quietly replaced him with Mexican native but U.S. citizen Joaquin Garay. Garay was fluent in both English and Spanish. He had a few bit parts in Hollywood featured under his belt. And at the time, he was a successful nightclub owner in San Francisco, and that's where Larry Landsberg reached out to him. By November of 1943, Garay was recording Panchito's scenes at the Disney studio. To animate the film's title song, the studio called upon the talents of legendary animator Ward Kimball. Now, years later, Kimball, who had amassed one of the most impressive, impressive bodies of work in animation history, actually said that the Three Caballeros main song sequence was the only animation I can look back on with pride. But, I mean, he's done a lot, wow. so he's done a lot yeah. of cool things. The scene was brilliant, though, and it was so brilliant, in fact, that his sequence director, uh, Jerry Geronimo, objected to half of it. Geronimo said, I can't show this to Walt. There are no hookups. A guy goes out here and comes out the top. What are you trying to do? Get me fired? <laughs> So, Panchito's explosion onto the screen, complete with dual six shooters, was heightened by Kimball's explosive animation. And it's worth noting that he never introduced himself as Panchito, nor does anyone refer to him by name for the duration of the picture. He came, he saw, he fired, he sang. And that's it. <laughs> so, the film was released to a great response, except for the countries that still weren't represented in the films. And the loudest of the bunch? It was Cuba, of course. Now, many people forget that, back then, Cuba was still a popular tourist destination, and it wouldn't be until the 1960s that a strengthening embargo would choke tourism to the country. But during the 1940s, our relations with Cuba were still good. In fact, much Cuban industry and land were owned by the United States of uh, interests, and many local 
popular nightclubs and casinos were allegedly under control of the mobsters from the United States, or at least that's what I read in The Godfather. Exactly. That's what yeah. I learned from The Godfather. Okay. So with such strong ties to the U.S., Cuba had every right to voice their opinion about not being represented in either of these films. So Disney considered a third compilation film, tentatively titled Cuban Carnival. And we actually explored this topic way back in episode 64, <laughs> so to hear all about that film and the potential fourth Cabrillo, you got to go back in time to listen to that episode. Definitely. The, the war, or the end of the war, opened up a new foreign markets for Disney films, allowing them to expand their horizons. The Goodwill program, no longer needed after the war ended, was defunded and closed its doors. Uh, that and the fact that the three Caballeros had lost money are contributing factors to why Cuban Carnival was never produced. And way back in the first part of the segment, we were talking about uh, the money that the U.S. government had at stake for the trip. Well, after release and the subsequent success of Saludos Amigos and the Three Caballeros, Walt remarked, The government never lost a nickel on them. We paid for our own trip and the pictures too, all with the profits from the film, so good on them. Yes, definitely. So, uh, wrapping up the end of the third part of our tribute to El Grupo and Walt Disney's trip to south of the border, we would love to know what your thoughts on these amazing films, the short films, everything that was produced in relation to the Goodwill trip. Give us a call on the Communicore Weekly GOAT line at 424-785-4628. That's 424-785-GOAT. He's a nerd, he's a, nerd. He's a geek, he's a geek. But we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his speech. Ah. It's George's Book of the Week. So I've reviewed, and I'm not bragging, well, yes, I am. Well over 200 books during the four years that we've done Communicore Weekly. And during that time, my favorite books have always pretty much remained the same. The Nickel Tour, Since the World Began, The Art of Walt Disney World, Reality Land, Disneyland Paris from Sketch to Reality, and a few others. And one of the books that I, you know, I think of most fondly is The Gardens of Walt Disney World Resort, a photographic tour of the themed gardens of the Magic Kingdom, Epcot Center, and other resort areas great title, which is from 1988. And it's a photographic journey of Walt Disney World that offers breathtaking photos of the resort, including many areas that simply aren't there any longer. And it's the one book that I go to when I need inspiration or just want to get lost and think about the Walt Disney World of a simpler time. And at a time when Disney books weren't so slick and driven by marketing, frankly, there really hasn't been anything published that's made me excited about a Disney book in a long time. Which brings us to the actual book we're going to talk about today, or for this episode. So I received a review copy of Capturing the Magic, A Photographic Journey Through the Walt Disney World Parks by Holly Wiencheck, and I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. So even before I cracked the spine, I was completely taken by this book. Uh, the book itself has a padded cover. Almost could use it as a pillow. It's actually fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's it, it gives you a great amount of heft. Uh, it makes it feel luxurious, like you've really got something special in your hands. But it is mostly a photo book, and I know what you're thinking. Why would you buy a photo book when there are a million people posting their photos online? Well, there's just something very special about a photo that's in print, especially one in a book, uh, you know, versus a digital file. It's sort of like the difference between vinyl and a CD, you know, the printed photo has a special warmth to it, you know, just like a vinyl record. And, and really, that's why you want to buy this book. The entire 256 pages exudes a warmth that doesn't disregard the excitement of the subject matter. So Holly, the writer, also was joined by photographer Bill Seferaza and Eric Weber. And they each took a long look at the Disney theme parks to create this book. They visited each park, and in most cases, each land, and they devoted text and photos. Uh, and it's more than just a photo book. Holly does present a very loving description of the park and the attractions. And she even throws in some nerdy little details. And we, we love the nerdy little details around here, definitely. So the, the photos themselves span different times of the day and the year. Uh, a few are, are at night with the park aglow and nary a soul in sight. And others have crowds of people surging from one area to the next. Uh, Eric and Bill, the photographers, really made a choice as to how they framed the shot and how they presented the image. 
And you know, in one note, I really like that the photos are presented without a lot of photoshopedness or you know the HDR that a lot of photographers use. I'm not knocking that. I just really love seeing these photos in their more with a more natural state. Some are in black and white, but mostly you're getting the image from the to photographer's eyes, and I really, really like that. Uh, as I mentioned, it covers all four of the Walt Disney World theme parks, and Animal Kingdom got just as much space as the rest. Hey, go figure. Heck yes. But, yeah, it is. But, you know, the only negative I can say about the book is I just wanted more photos. Why couldn't they have covered Downtown Disney and all of the resorts? I mean, I would have loved a five or 600 page book, although that would have been heavy. Maybe different volumes. Mm, probably, but yeah. something like that. Uh, and also, this is just a shout out to the uh, author and the photographers. I'd love some frame prints. I'm not trying to use my power of, my position of power to get stuff for free. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> but seriously, this is a $39 book. Uh, it's a hardcover, wonderful photos, 256 pages. It's absolutely gorgeous. And it's the sort of book that I wish Disney would produce or other people would produce about the parks. It's gorgeous, and it just envelops you. Really, really loved it. This week's book was Capturing the Magic by Holly Weincheck. What we liked, what we didn't like, yays in the booze! 60 Second Review! So Disney Art Academy is a new release for the Nintendo 3DS handheld game system. And it's something that I was kind of interested to try, because I've always liked drawing, just never been very good. And the fact that you've got a stylus with the system, and you can draw on the touch screen, and they can give you an example on the top screen, hey, it's a perfect fit for the Nintendo 3DS. And even though it's categorized as a game, I think it's going to have more appeal. And not just for kids, adults who have always wanted to be animators or learn about drawing are going to really, really like this one. So Disney Art Academy gives you step-by-step -step lessons showing you how to master expressions, portraits, shapes, action poses, drawing animals, drawing humans, how to draw in 3D, covers everything. You get uh, some brief lessons and it really shows you that this is something that you can do. The top screen will offer the instructions and the reference drawings so you can compare and each step is explained as you're introduced to layers and different types of tools like pens, erasers, pencils, markers, air, air spray, airbrush. Sorry, something like that. Wait, what? Yeah, what? Yeah, um, so one of the cool designs I liked was when you actually write with a stylus, the sounds that come out sound like a pencil or a marker. They really did a good job with it as well. Uh, you can fix your mistakes easily if you need to. You can zoom in to get to the finer details. And I was surprised at how well my drawings came out. I didn't feel like I was on my way to be a, I didn't feel like I was on my way to being a Disney animator, but, you know, these are some things I would put on my refrigerator, except it looked funny having my Nintendo 3DS on the fridge. It was kind of weird. Oh, kind of. How did you get it there? How did, how did you make it stay? Um, a hammer and a nail. Okay, fair. Go on. Yeah, anyway, so uh, when you reach the end of the lesson, they'll, they'll give you a star, which is great. You can share these. You can print them. You can upload the photos that you've done. I really enjoyed it. Had a good time with it. Took me a while to get used to the small 3DS screen, but beyond that, it was okay. Um, I think that Disney Art Academy is going to find its niche, and basically anybody who's got an interest in drawing or animation is really going to have a good time with this, especially because you can impress all of your friends that you can draw. Absolutely. Different characters. So, all right. I think you guys should pick it up. You'll enjoy it. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. When Disney's Animal Kingdom opened, the Asia section of the park was still under construction for a little while. So just before it finally opened, the Cali River Rapids was originally named the Tiger Rapids Run. However, not wanting to cause confusion because, you know, you can't actually see any tigers while on the ride, Disney opted to change the name. However, despite the lack of real tigers on the attraction, you can still see one singular tiger that may not be real. So when you're on the ride, once you're at the top of the lift hill, you will find a rock formation along with a waterfall directly in front of you. And if you pay close attention to the rock formation with the water falling around it, you'll realize that the rock work is actually in the form of a tiger's face. So there is a tiger in there somehow, some way, magically. It's interesting. That's impressive. What will the Imagineers not do. 
I don't I guess, know. Basically, well, well they won't like put that. real tigers on that attraction, so that's true. There you go. I don't know if they like the water as much. I mean, can you imagine sitting in one of those rafts with a tiger as it spins around? Yeah, that'd be weird. It's getting wet. Mm. Nobody oh, likes a wet of, tiger. No, no tigers but, don't no, even like being wet. I don't think. I had a good segue until you jumped in there. Oh, sorry. Let's forget so, I said that. No, no, Nobody say, likes say, a wet tiger. Go. Oh, but you know what people like? What that's, do they like? being picked for our year of a million or so limited time cadets oh, prizes yes nice work george even 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 tigers like being picked for our prize we we have picked a few tigers yeah they don't like it when we hand deliver it and bears because that's kind of creepy and yeah. scary but anyway so in case you uh, may not be aware we are giving away a prize every single week here at communicore weekly to enter you simply need to email communicore weekly at gmail.com with your name address and birthday and we'll add you to the ever-growing and ever-popular list of cadets that want to win a prize. Mm -hmm. So this week's prize winner is... This week's winner is Esmeralda G from Lake Balboa, California. Yay! Hooray! Congratulations, Esmeralda. I hope uh, the thing's working out with you and Quasimodo. Exactly. <laughs> um, Wrong Esmeralda? It makes perfect sense. It's okay. a Disney tie-in. Hey, yeah, that's what I was going for. That, I wonder if she like calls her significant other... Quasimodo. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe. All Who right, knows? well, I think we've reached the end of the show. So, <laughs> before we get in any trouble, thank you guys so much for watching and listening to another episode of Communicore Weekly. However you listen to the show, whether it's on YouTube or iTunes or other podcast apps, leave us a comment and a rating. We'd love to hear from you. Yes, and as I mentioned earlier, email us at communicoreweekly at gmail.com to enter the contest or just say us up. You can also like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Weekly. And follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm at Imagine Nerding. He's at Jeff Heimbuck. And of course, give us a call on the Communicore Weekly Goat Line at 424-785-4628. And visit the Communa store at communicoreweekly.com where you can get some awesome t-shirts. And there's still time to get your official cadet membership card and sticker just by sending a self-addressed stamped envelope to Communicore Weekly, P.O. Box 432, Orange, California, 92856. And you can always visit patreon.com slash Communicore Weekly to find out who you two can support the greatest online show. For Jeff Heimbuck, I'm George Taylor. And for George Taylor, I'm Jeff Heimbuck. Thanks so much for listening, guys and gals. We'll see you next time on Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. <laughs>